hey what's up you guys it's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel um, in today's video we are going into chapter 27 of one of us is next by Karen and McManus I'm sorry for the earthquake that's going on a little bit my dog is standing underneath my desk and I don't know why uh, my whole living room is kind of in shambles right now because my dad and my husband put in a new heater AC unit thingy into our window and now my whole living room is a mess but my husband said don't worry about it I'll do it when I get home from work so I'm gonna hold him to it but anyways let's get right into this video this video may contain sensitive topics and foul language if you do not wish to continue please click off the video now you have been warned chapter 27 Maeve Friday March 27th is there a word for stalking your friend stalker Knox asks in a lo low musing voice congeal pursuit I say without looking up for my laptop that's two words and terrible it's almost 8.30 on a Friday night and we're settled into a window table at a coffee shop in Ronaldo Village. Broen is with Nate, Louise is working, my parents are at a charity event, and I couldn't stand rattling around my house alone for two hours while I waited for the after party at Ashton and Eli's rehearsal dinner to start. So I called Knox. Neither of us could talk about anything except intense sky. Talking turned into driving, and here we are. The coffee inn in this place is awful, but the view is ideal. We're almost directly across from the house. We followed Intense Guy to from Calhoun Park. There's something comforting about knowing he's at home, Knox says. The driveway was empty when we got there, but the blue car pulled up a few minutes later and we watched Intense Guy enter the small ranch house alone. He hasn't left since. I know, I say absently. My eyes on the laptop screen. I brought it along so I could keep working on opening the documents I pulled from Knox's mother's computer. Knox has his computer too, and he's been using it to Google David Jackson with the usual useless results. Knox sucks down half a sprite with one noisy pull on a straw and asks, What time do we have to leave to get to where is Ashton and Eli's party again? Talia's restaurant on Charles Street, I say. We can hang out for another 20 minutes or so. Great, Knox says, glancing around the nondescript coffee shop. The walls are prison gray and the tables and chairs grade school cafeteria style and the baked goods displayed on the counter look like they've been there for a while. The barista yawns as he erases hot chocolate from the chalkboard menu behind him and tosses an empty Swiss Miss cardboard box into the trash. Do you think Phoebe will be there? I doubt it. She's pretty much living at the hospital right now. Suddenly the document in front of me springs open and I give Knox a triumphant smile. I'm in. Got the first one open. This is, hmm... Probably not relevant. It's something to do with a case settled for Weber Red Consulting Group in Florida. <coughs> I scan the first few pages quickly, then close the document and pull up the second. Let me try the other one. Nice work, Sherlock, Knox says. He looks pensive, though, and rubs his hand over his face as he gazes out the window. I wish we had the same luck digging dirt up on this guy. We're right across the street from him, and we're still do don't know what who he is. Has the revenge form said anything interesting lately or worrying? I have vengeance in his mind open in another browser and I've been getting gotten a couple of ping me alerts since we've been there. But it's just ranting the names I don't recognize. Nothing from dark is mine, I say. He's been quiet since the that post about Phoebe. Knox shifts restlessly in his seat. What did the note he left at Cafe Contigo say again? He didn't sign it with an initial or anything, did he? No, I say, decisively, and then I pause. I read the note pretty quickly, after all, and I wasn't the calmest state of mind. I don't think so, but let's double check. I tear my eyes away from the screen where the headline settlement on behalf of Eagle Granite Manufacturing Corporation, Eastland, California, has popped up to dig my phone out of my bag. I open my photos and scroll until I find the right one. I took a picture, I say, handing the phone to Knox. See for yourself? Knox squints, and then every bit of color drains from his head, face. His head snaps up, his expression tense. What the hell? Before I can question the quick change demeanor, he adds, Why didn't you show me this before? I blink. Is he mad at me? What are you talking about? I read it to you at Cafe Contigo. That's not the same thing, he insists. My scalp prickles at the decidedly unknox tone of his voice. How is that not the same thing? You know what it says, but I didn't know how it looks. I don't. He thrust my phone at me, cutting off my next be bewildered question. I'm talking about the font, how the note was written. You know this type that looks like handwriting but isn't? I've seen it before. The latest batch of death threats that until proven used it. What? I ask. When Knox doesn't answer right away, I repeat, what? Yeah, hang on, Knox says. He puts my phone down and turns to his laptop, fingers flying over his keyboard. Sandeep thought the threats were related to the D. Stowe case, so I'm gonna... I have a bunch of stuff 
in my G drive. He angles the computer so I can see his screen. This is a spreadsheet of everybody involved in the DeAngsto case. I'll check for David Jackson. He types the name into the search bar. Neither of us breathes until it comes up blank. Try just Jackson, I say. This time we get a result right away. Officer Ray Jackson, defendant, accused of assisting Sergeant Carl DeAngsto and blackmailing and framing 17 innocent people for drug possession, age 24, status in jail, awaiting trial. Huh. I say, Ray Jackson. Maybe he's related to David Jackson? Maybe, Knox says. He's still tapping away, eyes glued to the screen. Hang on. I indexed all the media coverage, too. Let's see if they mention family. He's silent for a couple of minutes, then angles the screen toward me. This is an article that includes Jackson and brother in it somewhere. A news clip fills the screen showing Sergeant D. Ingsto with his arm around a clean-cut young guy holding a plaque. I remember this article, Knox says. I read it with Bethany. It's about D. Ingsto giving some mentoring award. He points to the caption. This week before his arrest, Sergeant Carl Dingso commended San Diego State University students for excellence in community peer mentoring. Okay, so that Dingsto, I say. What does it say about Jackson? Both our eyes race over the page, but mine are faster. I almost gasp when I see it. Ironically, one of the at-risk youths receiving peer mentoring was Ray Jackson's younger brother, Jared, 19, on probation last year for petty theft. I read, program of... Officials said Jared Jackson excelled in the program and now works part-time for a local construction company. I turned toward Knox. Is there a picture of Ray Jackson anywhere? Yeah, not in this article, but Knox pulls up another news story with a thumbnail. Photos of each of the accused officers. He clicks on the one marked Ray Jackson, then enlarges it until it fills half the screen. At the size, even though it's a little blurry, there's no mistaking the similarity around the mouth and eyes between Ray Jackson and the guy we trailed from Calhoun Park. Intense guy is Jared Jackson, I breathe. Ray Jackson's brother. He must be the a he must be. The age is right and the face is right. They're definitely related. Yeah, Knox says. And the note he left for Phoebe is identical to the ones we've been getting at until proven so. Jared Jackson must also be the person who's been sending threats to Eli. His brow furrows, which makes a twisted kind of sense, I guess, since Eli put his brother in jail. But what's his problem with Phoebe? I don't know, but we better tell Eli, I say. Knox reaches for his phone, but I've already pressed Eli's number on mine. Within seconds, his voice fills my ear. This is Eli Klein better. I'm not checking voicemail until Monday, March 30th. If you need immediate assistance with the legal matter, please call Sandeep Gahi of Until Proven at 555-239-4758. Otherwise, leave a message. Straight to voicemail, I tell Knox. Oh, right, Knox says. He promised Ashton he'd shut his phone off all weekend so they could get married in peace. Unease nips at my stomach. Guess we'll have to tell him in person then. It's almost time to leave for the party anyway. Hang on. Knox's fingers move across his laptop trackpad. I just plugged Jared Jackson into Google and there's a lot here. His eyes flick up and down the screen. So yeah, he was arrested for stealing from a convenience store right after he graduated high school. Got probation, did the mentoring program, started working for a construction company. Something tugs at my subconscious. Then, but Knox is still taught talking and the fragment disappears he doesn't seem to have any run-ins with the law since but there's a bunch of stuff here on the fallout from his brother's arrest he goes silent for a minute as he reads it doesn't mention their dad by name but i'll bet that's david jackson he has lung cancer and they lost their house after jared's brother went to jail so that sucks so that sucks obviously understatement and their mom oh shit knocks sucks in a sharp breath raising troubled eyes toward me the mom killed herself on christmas eve well, they think it was suicide. She overdosed on sleeping pills, but she didn't leave a note. Oh, no. My heart drops as I stare at the Jackson's house, dark except for the yellowish glow of a lamp silhouetted in the first floor window. Everything about that house looks f florin, from the crooked lampshade to the lopsided blinds. That's horrible. Yeah, it is. Knox follows my gaze. Okay, now I feel bad for Jared. He's had a shit time. Maybe this is all just some twisted way of blowing off steam. Maybe, I say, and then I jump as... The lamp in the Jackson window suddenly goes off, plunging the house into darkness. The door opens and a shadowy figure emerges. Knox pushes his laptop to one side and fumbles with the zipper on his backpack, rooting around until he pulls out his binoculars. Seriously, I ask? He brings them to his eyes. We're the only ones in the coffee shop except the barista who's been ignoring us since we got our drinks, but still. This is not exactly a stealthy way to keep tabs on your nemesis. You brought those... Of course I did. They have night vision mode, Knox adjusts the outer lenses and f leans forward, peering through the window as the figure steps onto a section of the driveway illuminated by a nearby streetlight. It's Jared. I could tell that without binoculars. He has a backpack and he's getting into the car. 
Nox, I can see him perfectly fine. A ping me alert flashes across my screen. The website you were monitoring has been updated. I minimize the document from Mrs. Meyer's computer and navigate to the Vengeance is Mine form. Tick tock, time's up. Guess I'll just fucking do it myself. Dark is mind. My blood chills. I don't know what the words mean, but I know beyond a shadow of doubt that they can't be good. I slam my laptop closed and stuff it into my bag. Come on, we need to follow him. I say, he's up to something. That is the end of chapter 27. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!